Stan. Yes, sir. Thank you. Welcome back to the podcast, man. I appreciate it, brother. I'd love to to jump right in. I feel like there's a lot of people that at some point they they'd like to lose like an extra 15 to 20 pounds, whether it's just they're unhappy with their weight or whether it's they want to get ready for a certain event. And while I do think that you have to play the long game when it comes to your health and wellness, I do think there is something to be said for setting a goal like that to either challenge yourself, jumpstart some sort of transformation. But I do think you have to do it effectively so that you drop body fat and not muscle. So where does somebody begin if they want to accomplish that? Well, it's interesting. You're, you're kind of, my, my brain's going a number of different directions here. If somebody wants to lose, it sounds like the question is, do they want to lose some weight kind of quickly? Quickly and effectively. And effectively, right. Um, we used to think that the faster you lost weight, the more you would suppress your basal metabolic rate. And now the research suggests that that's not the case, that uh, it's based on the weight loss, not the rate of weight loss. Uh, but the faster you lose weight, the larger the calorie deficit, you may expose yourself to a greater, uh, loss of lean body mass as a percentage of the total weight loss. Right. And so we would want to mitigate that. We would want not to lose muscle when losing weight fast. Uh, I want to say it was Kevin Hall's research. Uh, he's out of Canada, isn't he? Um, that, that found that even if you had a 500 calorie deficit or a thousand calorie deficit, and even if the 500 calorie deficit had 1.6 grams of protein per pound of body weight, and the thousand calorie deficit only had one gram of protein per pound of body weight, you see what I'm setting you up for here is two very extreme differences, a lower protein, higher calorie deficit compared to a higher protein, lower calorie deficit. Uh, equating for total calories, the two groups, presuming the resistance training program was sufficient, did not differentially lose muscle. I don't know if that's the, the, the most clear way to state it, but they both retained their lean body mass to the same degree and lost uh, weight, body fat. But the the weight training had to be intense. That was the key component. So you can retain lean body mass, but you have to train hard. That's the stimulus. And he did find that the group with the larger calorie deficit and the lower protein experienced greater fatigue and had a higher dropout rate. And so I would just want my client, if they wanted to lose a lot of weight fast, I would just want them to know they were going to have to put in a significant amount of hard weightlifting, and they would would likely experience uh, a greater degree of fatigue. They would just feel more tired throughout this process. And if they were willing to make that sacrifice um, uh, and that commitment, then they could experience a greater amount of fat loss in a shorter period of time. Uh, and then, of course, we would want to resume some sort of maintenance where they could reintroduce some calories and adhere to that for an extended period of time. That's, it's not a long-term solution, but that's what I would have to say about that plan. I think before we dive more into the weeds on this, because I think what I, what, from what I understand, the biggest ways to mitigate the amount of muscle you might lose when you're trying to lose weight quickly and again, effectively is keeping your, your protein high, right? And then also um, resistance training towards near failure, training pretty hard at a high intensity. Before we get into to how we do that, what do you think is a realistic time frame for somebody where they're like, all right, I know I need to lose this weight. I want to do it effectively um, and quickly. I want to push myself, but I don't want to set myself up for failure where I'm like, all right, I'm going to try to lose weight in like two weeks. So like, what's a, what's a healthy time frame? you think? We look at it in terms of percentage of weight lost for total current body weight. 
and we like to see about a, a 1%, maybe even, yeah, about a 1% weekly weight loss would be something that was sustainable uh, with the least amount of potential uh, muscle loss, presuming you had adequate protein and, and the training stimulus. Um, if somebody wanted to be more aggressive than that and include the intense lifting program, uh, then they could go to a 2% weight loss, say a, a 200 pound person might want to lose four pounds a week. Uh, that's possible with the thousand calorie a day deficit. <laughs> and, and that's going to require both, uh, energy intake reduction and energy, energy expenditure increase. You're probably going to have to work on both sides of the equation pretty aggressively to, to reach a thousand calorie a day deficit which would mean 15, 16,000 steps uh, plus, you know, a, a six, 700 calorie daily deficit uh, uh, of, of intake. Uh, plus the, the resistance training. So we're talking about a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of work. And under that scenario, and remember, you're going to lose some water. You probably lose some food bulk. And so you might see, you know, an extra three or four pounds in the first two weeks on top of the two pounds that you're going to lose each week. So, I mean, it's very reasonable that you could lose, uh, you know, up to four pounds the first week and second week and third, maybe 12 pounds in three weeks, depending on how much body fat you have and how much uh, water retention or, you know, carbohydrates you were consuming previously, because those will obviously get reduced with the total caloric reduction. I'm not suggesting keto, but um, you know, and, and just the volume of food that you'd be eating would be minimized. So you'd have less food bulk and water in the intestine. So, yeah, I would think, you know, 12 pounds in three weeks would be really reasonable. Um, you'd have to fight for your lean mass by training hard. But other than that, uh, we could see that. I want to get into the training part in just a second, because I think that'll also tie into somebody who's really trying to build muscle and take their training to the next level. Cause I imagine if, if somebody, somebody who's trying to do that is also gonna have to follow a similar protocol to what we're discussing. Now, I think a lot of people, and I, I know you agree with this as well. Cause we, we, I, I've just, from talking to you, I just, I, I know we're on the same, same page. They struggle with like people struggle with habit formation and sticking to things. Right. And I think one of the things that really trips people up is when they go to start something like this, they're like, Oh, this sounds great. I'm going to start tomorrow but they've been not leading this healthy lifestyle for months or years or whatever. What do you think are some of the daily habits that people should focus on if they're trying to, you know, lose this 12 pounds of body fat in three weeks or lose the 15 to 20 pounds of fat over a period of time? What, 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 what habits should they be uh, focusing on each day? Well, let's look at both sides of the equation. Let's start with the energy intake side. Uh, the most important thing to adhere to a diet is that, you uh, uh, avoid uh, or minimize hunger. Uh, you'll lose that battle every time. Uh, willpower is not an effective method to uh, lose weight. You're going to have to utilize some strategies to stay satiated. So we focus on that as far as energy intake goes. If you're going to reduce your calories, then you're going to want to make sure you're eating mo more whole foods and less ultra processed foods. Uh, ultra processed foods will just, you just won't be as, as, uh, as full and you'll want to eat more. Uh, we'll want to increase our protein intake it has a high thermic effect of food and it's very satiating. We we'll want to increase our fiber and we'll eat some salads. There's high satiety foods. There's an index that where they measure how long certain foods keep people full. Boiled potatoes and oranges are at the highest of that index, along with high protein and high fiber foods. Uh, you want to sleep more. Because when you sleep less, your body releases more ghrelin, the hunger hormone, and starts stimulating hunger. And you become insulin resistant as a result of sleeping less. Um, those are all satiety techniques. Drinking more water, particularly during the meal, uh, helps expand the, the rugae of the stomach, which triggers the signal for satiety. Um, uh, eating slower. You're, there seems to be kind of a almost like a time clock that starts ticking when you start eating. And the slower you eat, then you'll, you'll, your body will uh, receive a, a, a satiety signal in about 20 minutes or so. So just being more, uh, chewing your food slower, putting your fork down and not shoveling it in. Uh, that's a host of different satiety techniques 
to battle hunger on the energy intake side, a higher protein diet, uh, uh, as mentioned, because of the thermic effect of food. So now let's look at the energy expenditure side. Um, in terms of compliance with your exercise program, just increasing your step counts is probably the most important thing you can do. It increases society. Uh, I like to do the 10 minute walks three times a day. I, I find that if when I assign uh, extended periods of steady state cardio, like 40 minutes on the treadmill, which is very common for a, a, you know, a dietitian or a, a coach to give their clients uh, 40 minutes on a treadmill. There's so many barriers to entry. If it's not something you're, you're used to doing and not something you enjoy doing, I always say the best exercise is the one you'll do. You know, you got to come home, you got to change, you got to get in the car, you got to drive to the gym, you got to put in 40 minutes of monotonous, you know, boring uh, treadmill. That's the first thing that's going to, going to, uh, be abandoned. It's going to go by the wayside when you have anything else on your schedule, kids, job, working late, etc. So I try and do the 10 minute walks. They're more sustainable. I can do them after meals. And so you attach a habit to an existing behavior or you try and create a habit by attaching it to an existing behavior, such as eating. You can do them anywhere at any time. They don't, uh, you know, your schedule doesn't seem to interfere with that. And you can accumulate thousands of steps a day uh, it, it's better for digestion. It's better for blood sugar control. There's this whole host of reasons why I'm a huge fan of just getting your 10 minute walks in, wake up in the morning, take a walk. Uh, you know, I walk my kids to school in the morning after you eat lunch, take a walk. And then at dinner or sometime before bed after dinner, or sometime before bed, take another walk. Um, that to me would be a, a big thing, just trying to get step count up and wear a step counter if you want to measure it, because when people diet, they tend to move less because they, they start to get a little more tired from the calorie deficit. Um, secondly would be the training stimulus. And again, the best exercise is the one you'll do. And I, I, it should have a resistance component to it if you want to keep your lean mass. Uh, not everybody enjoys doing that. I'm very careful not to assume that everybody loves going to the gym like I do uh, and loves the feeling of lifting weights. Some people think that's quite painful, to be honest. And uh, so I try and design a program that's more comfortable, even if I have to walk the client through or pick the exercises such that they'll enjoy them uh, and get in and do some resistance training. A precautionary note is not to try and do too much because then what happens is uh, people will suffer from what's been termed compensation. If you start going to say a CrossFit workout and do a bunch of battle ropes and burpees, you'll come home and you'll sit more and eat more because you're tired. And so I'm cautious not to uh, encourage people to overtrain. Uh, it's not sustainable and they'll end up uh, eating more and sitting more. And that non-exercise activity burns more, more calories than the exercise activity. The non-exercise activity is just staying on your feet, moving around throughout the day, fidgeting more, blinking more, just the kind of things that burn calories uh, at quote unquote at rest. Uh, and if you're, crushing yourself for 30 minutes at a 40 minutes at a CrossFit workout. And then you come home and sit on the couch for six hours because you're exhausted and you're too close to the refrigerator. So you start snacking. Uh, that's a net negative. And so I don't believe in battle ropes and burpees. I don't assign those to my clients again, unless they enjoy them. Uh, I think this should be a very deliberate, very evidence-based, uh, resistance training program. Um, and, you know, we could go over the steps of that as well. It's Schoenfeld's research. He's pretty well laid out a whole chart of uh, frequency, volume, intensity, load, um, you know, rest periods, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, all of those things, I, I try and get my, at, my uh, clients to train as a bodybuilder would or, you know, maybe even lifting a little heavier weight than they're accustomed to just because it, uh, it can retain lean mass. Let's dive into Schoenfeld's research and talk about what you were touching on towards the beginning where you were like, the people that maintain their muscle, they trained hard. And I, I think that people might misunderstand what it means to train hard because when you're training hard, there's a certain, it's a certain intensity, a certain feeling like you're going to, towards near fatigue, there's a certain stimulus. So talk a bit about how he's laid this out in his research. And then if, if somebody is trying to do what we're talking about in losing um, a good amount of body fat while main, while retaining muscle, 
what should that program and intensity look like? First of all, he talks about frequency. We see in the research that training everybody part twice a week is better than if you train it once a week. Um, so if you want no more do, chat, no more chest day on Mondays. That's right. It's not not the one to once every Monday night chest max out day. Uh, and so you know, for the average individual, I'll have them do an upper body day, day off, lower body day, day off, upper body day, and I might do like Monday and Friday would be upper upper body and then Wednesday and the following Monday would be lower body. So that'd be an eight day split. It would allow people to train the, you know, on the same days every week. You train Monday, Wednesday, Friday. This would be kind of my out of the gate um, uh, prescription for the average individual that wants to go to the gym. Because it's, uh, and, and I guess the most important factor, people always ask about the split. If there's some split that's better than the other. And Presuming you adhere to these evidence-based guidelines for hypertrophy, the best split's the one you'll adhere to. It's the one that fits your schedule. If you can only train twice a week, then we design a training program that hits, that checks all the boxes, but is just twice a week. If you can train three times a week, then I'm designing a program like I just mentioned, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And if you can train four times a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, I'll design a program for that. But they should check these boxes. Let's hit them real quick. Frequency, train everybody part about twice a week. Uh, volume, do about 10 to 20 sets per body part per week. So at each workout, say if you're doing chest on Monday, you want to do about five sets. That would be a minimum to be effective for a stimulus. And probably a maximum would be around 10. And it, it's not necessary to, to, to do that, but uh, five would be about what you probably want to start at or, or use for performance. Uh, so twice a week, you do five sets of chest. I usually pick two exercises and do three sets of each. That gives me six sets of chest for Monday and six sets on Friday. Uh, the effort is where the key component is. You can build muscle uh, to an equivalent degree, lifting a heavy load for five reps, a medium load for 10 to 12 reps, or a light load for 20, 25, maybe even 30 reps. So long as you get to within a rep or two of failure uh, in that whatever rep range that you choose, which whatever load that you choose. So if you do 10 reps and you could have done 20, it's not a sufficient stimulus. Maybe a newbie who just started going to the gym for the first time would start to see some results. But for anybody who's had any minimal amount of exposure uh, to lifting weights, you want to get to within what we call reps in reserve to within about one to three reps of failure. So you probably couldn't do four more. And the more experienced you get, the closer to failure you have to get in order to get the sufficient stimulus. Um, so that would be your, your load and your effort. They're kind of both covered there. Heavy load for low reps, a lighter load for higher reps. So long as the effort is sufficient, you're going to get a similar result. Next probably would be exercise selection. We generally like to use a multi-joint movement because you work more muscle parts. Um, until you get more advanced, then maybe you'll use an isolation movement, but it's going to take longer to finish a workout. But generally, we'll pick multi-joint movements. Um, the tempo, uh, how fast you move the weights, you just want to bring it down under control, what we call the eccentric. Two, three seconds, certainly no more than five is necessary. These 10, 20-second eccentrics don't provide you any better benefit than a two-second eccentric. Uh, so you just don't want to move the weight too fast, completely like crash the eccentric down. So control the weight on the way down. Uh, range of motion should be a full range of motion. The more range of motion, the longer the muscle lengths, the better the hypertrophy response. Uh, I was A little clip of me appeared recently regarding the fact that I said that you get equivalent results from full range of motion weightlifting as you do from uh, static stretching in terms of flexibility. Uh, static stretching doesn't give you any additional benefit to uh, lifting through a full range of motion for flexibility, uh, while the weightlifting would give you the additional benefit of the hypertrophy training. So uh, people got all upset about that, but it is a fact. It's Schoenfeld's research. It's very recent, and it's uh, been replicated many times in, in meta-analyses and systematic reviews. Uh, I also went on to mention that it doesn't reduce injury risk and it doesn't uh, help aid in recovery from training. So people thought I was attacking stretching, but 
uh, for the most part, I'm just trying to demonstrate that weightlifting provides uh, a sufficient uh, flexibility stimulus, presuming you, you lift through a full range of motion. Uh, next up would probably be um, rest periods. And this is important. Uh, this is where I think most people go wrong. They get into the gym and they try and lift weights as though it's exercise. And it's not. It's training. There's a difference between the two. Exercise is battle ropes and burpees. You get your heart rate up and you sweat a lot and you, you breathe heavy and you think you got a great workout in and you burned a lot of calories. That's not the purpose of weight training. Uh, not, not what we're describing in trying to maintain or gain lean muscle tissue. Training is measurable and progressible. That you should be able to, over time, uh, A, provide a sufficient stimulus for hypertrophy, but B, uh, be able to progress that over time. Add five pounds, add one rep, eventually one more set. It's, you should get, quote unquote, better at it uh, as you continue to do it. Otherwise, the stimulus will no longer uh, be there to provide additional uh, hypertrophy benefits. So the rest periods, people go in and they'll try and just do exercises and only rest 30 seconds or 60 seconds. Uh, and we have research now to show that when you compare a one minute rest to a three minute rest, uh, the three minute rest outperforms the one minute rest for hypertrophy, for measurable uh, muscle uh, gains. And so I encourage people to rest longer between sets. And I know it takes a little longer to do the workout. Maybe if your time is a, an issue, then you can superset an upper body and lower body movement, or even antagonistic body parts, chest and back. You can do a chest exercise, rest for a minute, do a back exercise, rest for a minute. And by the time you get around back around to the chest exercise, you've had nearly three minutes rest and you can exert a similar amount uh, or hopefully perform a similar number of repetitions with the same weight. That would be the goal. If you have a significant decline in repetitions, if you between your first set of chest and your second set of chest and your third set of chest, if you have a significant decline, then there may be uh, a reason for that that's not uh, muscular. It might be substrates like creatine phosphate replenishment, um, uh, acid, uh, uh, you know, the, the hydrogen ion buildup from, you know, lactate and hydrogen ion buildup, uh, dissipation, um, central, your nervous system recovering from the previous set. All of those things could impact your cardiovascular capacity. All those things could impact your ability to perform the second and third set with uh, a, an equivalent effort and load as the first set that might not necessarily benefit the, the or provide the stimulus that you want, benefit the result. Uh, so I would say that you don't want oxygen debt to be the limiting factor. Uh, it's again, you're not doing cardiovascular training, you're doing uh, hypertrophy training. So the rest periods is where a lot of people get bound up, including, you know, I work with professional athletes. I work with John Jones and Henry Cejudo, and I currently work with uh, uh, Amir Abdullah, who's the uh, number two ranked featherweight in the UFC. Um, and they all want to move fast through the workouts. They, they try and they think it's sports specific for training. And it, it's, it's not. It's a completely different stimulus. And so I have to try and slow them down or trick them into uh, delaying, uh, you know, so I can get them to lift. I want them to get stronger. That's the goal of weightlifting for athletes is to increase force production, period. It's not to condition them for their sport. That's what you do with their sport or with, you know, a conditioning program. Uh, but that's just an aside. And I think that pretty much covers uh, everything in uh, the, that uh, Brad Schoenfeld has researched in terms of the evidence-based hypertrophy principles, uh, even for the average individual. So if, if somebody's listening to this and they follow what you're essentially talking about, this goes back to what you said before, that the person who you know eats a higher protein diet doesn't have to go into as much of a calorie deficit, assuming that they are training hard like you're hinting at here, right? Yeah, yeah. And if they're eating high protein, a gram of protein per pound of body weight, let's say, uh, and that's presuming they don't have a significant amount of excess body fat because you you, you, don't, you can't chase that much weight with protein. It's unnecessary and beneficial. Uh, and they only have a small deficit and they're interested in only losing one pound or 1% of their body weight a week. Uh, then 
the training intensity and the amount of fatigue that you'll accumulate can be less. Uh, you can do a little fewer sets and, uh, and still maintain lean body mass as long as you're consistent. I always say that, that consistency is more important than intensity. And you touched on that right out of the gate. You know, people start these programs and then they don't adhere to them. And I always remind them, look, just, just show up. You know, in the beginning, make sure and schedule something that you know you can adhere to. Uh, don't set yourself up for failure. Uh, and then just show up and and do something. And what you find is that just being at the gym and starting to touch a few weights, uh, you can put a sufficient amount of intensity into a couple good sets for a body part and, and, uh, and not have any muscle loss while you're dieting. You talked about some things people can do to increase satiety, to, you know, reduce the amount of hunger that they have so that they can follow their, their plan. They can stick to their diet. Um, what have you found to be like, what's the most effective way for somebody to reduce their caloric intake? And then I guess, but what parallels that in tracking what they eat? Because I feel like a lot of people, you tell them like, well, write down your food. They're like, wow, I don't have time for that. Well, put it into like an app. Well, I don't have time for that. Well, measure it. Well, I don't have time for that. So I feel like sometimes we, as coaches, you can run up against these walls because people are, in fact, busy, yet they do have these goals. So if somebody's ready and ready to rock and they want to to reach this goal that we've been talking about, what have you found to be the simplest way for somebody to track what they're eating? And then also, like, what's the best way for somebody to reduce calories? I got to tell you, for a client like you just mentioned, a very busy professional individual, uh, meal prepping. And we've had plenty of research to show that uh, one of the most beneficial, uh, measurable lifestyle changes you can make would be meal prepping. That's whether you utilize a meal prep company, and I'm not shilling, I, I own the Vertical Diet Meal Prep, I ship meals nationwide, but whether you make your own meals or you get them from a local meal prep provider or utilize one of the you know, meal prep providers, uh, that is a, an extremely successful uh, behavior. The bodybuilding figure physique bikini industry has been doing this for decades. They carry around their Tupperwares and they put them in their six pack bag and they, everywhere they go, they're eating out of their little Tupperwares. And it seems somewhat laughable to, to the general population, but that's the reason why they're so successful. They eat exactly what they're supposed to eat every day on a clock. Uh, the exact number of total calories and the macros that they prefer. We can get into macros, but, uh, that's how you control calories. If you get hungry and go open the refrigerator, uh, you're probably going to lose that battle. You're going to grab a food that you're hungry for and you're going to overconsume it. If you get hungry and go to lunch at a fast food place or at a restaurant, uh, you're generally going to order more calories than, than you should be consuming to maintain a calorie deficit. Um, those are, those are very difficult, uh, paths to, to take. You're just, you're going to fail on that. Restaurants underestimate their caloric, uh, their, their calorie count by up to 40, 50%. And, and we're terrible at, at, uh, at estimating portion sizes. We're off by 50%, generally speaking, particularly when you get a lot of quote unquote hidden calories, uh, oils and stuff that foods are cooked in, uh, just a tablespoon of butter or a tablespoon of olive oil or a tablespoon of uh, you know, something that's cooked in that's 150 calories right there. You get a couple of those and you've, you've blown your deficit for the day. So those are, you know, I think meal prepping is the number one thing for that type of individual that you just described. Uh, and then after that, you know, we talked earlier about eating more whole foods and uh, eating higher protein diet uh, and higher satiety foods and getting more sleep. Uh, but the meal prepping, I mean, that's, that's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. If you make all your food for the day, and you just eat the food that you're supposed to eat for the day, uh, you're going to be more successful than if you just try and wing it. And, you know, you're absolutely right. Some people don't like to count calories. Uh, some people even object to the idea that it is a calorie equation at all. They, that they, they are offended by the idea of Kiko, calories in, calories out. And it's because they don't appreciate that the equation is actually total daily energy intake and total daily energy expenditure. And it accounts for things like the difference between a carrot and a cookie in terms of calories uh, due to fiber. It accounts for things like, you know, exercise activity, 
uh, and thermic effect of food, higher protein diets, uh, netting out fewer total calories. So the equation accounts for all of those things, but people will often, uh, they'll, they'll migrate to one of the diets that, that uh, promises them they don't have to count calories. Uh, let's talk about the three types of diets real quickly. There's only three types of diets. There's only three ways to reach a calorie deficit. Uh, Dr. Peter Atia refers to this as CR, TR, and DR. Calorie restriction, that's what you and I have been discussing. You weigh and measure your food. You use an app. Uh, you learn how many calories are in your food. You use the label on the back of the box or whatever, and you, you track exactly how many calories you consume. That's calorie restriction. Uh, another option is time restriction. Maybe you eat a 16-8 or a, you know, a 24. You just eat within a particular time window and you don't eat outside of that window. That's a form of caloric restriction. It's just that you measure it in terms of time rather than counting calories. Uh, the other one's going to be dietary restriction. And that's where you start eliminating food groups. That's your keto folks. I'm not going to eat any carbs. I'm going to res dietary restrict. Uh, paleo people, I'm not going to eat anything that a caveman didn't catch, right? Um, that's dietary restriction. So you have, and you can couple them together. You can do keto intermittent fasting. I'm going to cut out carbs and I'm only going to eat between noon and four. Uh, so those are all strategies that you can implement. None of them have been proven to be any more successful than the other. There's nothing magic about them. Uh, over you know, thousands and thousands of studies on millions of people for many years now, we've discovered that, uh, that uh, dietary adherence uh, is the most important factor. And you just have to pick the diet, as Lane always says, that feels the least restrictive to you. And so I have keto clients. I have carnivore clients. I have vegan clients. Uh, I have clients that intermittent fast. And it's because they choose to do that because they find it's easier for them to comply with the diet. I have more clients that count calories because that's my preference. I don't like restricting time because I feel that potentially it compromises lean body mass. I don't like restricting carbs because I feel like it uh, compromises performance and it's not necessarily that sustainable long term. People always feel as eventually like Dr. Peter Atia after three years of pissing on keto sticks uh, and, you know, talking about the, all the benefits of keto uh, now eats carbs again because it's discovered that it's important for anaerobic performance for weightlifting. And it, uh, it's also uh, more sustainable in terms of how his family eats. So he doesn't have to feel so restrictive. So that's, that's the nuts and bolts of, of, of the options that are available. And I encourage people to pick the one they feel works the best for them. And, but I, my specific recommendations are, are, you know, a more evenly balanced diet that you track. And then uh, because it has a performance benefit that a lot of people that I work with, I want them to be able to have a good training session. And so I think that one of the other roadblocks that people bump into, so let's just say the person that we're, let's just say that the, you know, the people we're trying to reach now have already accepted the fact, okay, if I want to lose body fat and I want to maintain muscle, I have to do these things that we've already talked about. But then they hit this roadblock where they're maybe three days into it, four days into it. And they're like, wait a second. I don't look any better. I don't feel any better. I'm not losing any weight. Do you think the person then is not eating enough? Are they eating too much? Like how do they determine like where to go from there? Yeah. Well, for a while there, some people were claiming that you could uh, ruin your metabolism by not eating enough. And in fact, that's not the case. Generally what we find, and I, I hate, this conversation because it's blaming the victim. Generally, what we find is people aren't accurately measuring their intake. Uh, sips, licks, bites, snacks, uh, drinks. Um, generally speaking, what they presume to think is a 1500 calorie diet uh, averages out to about 2200 for the week when they include uh, you know, a, a binge, uh, you know, one evening or they go to dinner with the wife or uh, they just aren't accurately counting every thing that they're consuming that that's 90 plus percent of the time i just find that there's a, a problem with uh accountability on on tracking calories uh and that always seems like i'm blaming the individual but it's just it's factual that there's there's no uh, metabolic damage that just hasn't been proven and so uh, generally what happens if people plateau sometimes especially if they're beginners and they have a significant amount of body fat and they're just starting to lift weights, 
they're recompositioning and they're gaining some muscle and losing some fat. And the scale isn't going to tell you any, any anything you want to hear on that. Uh, but a tape measure may and uh, a progress picture may. And if you have, a, a, if you start with progress pictures and you start with tape measurements of your waist in particular, the scale might not move at all for a week or two, but you might lose an inch on your waist. And that means you're gaining muscle and losing fat. There's also uh, the fact that weight loss isn't linear and there will be times at which uh, your, your body, you do not lose weight. Even though you did everything the same that you did the prior week where you did lose two pounds, then you lost zero. Uh, a few things can happen. You should weigh in daily and average the total for the week and compare it to previous weeks. Uh, looking at the daily fluctuations can be discouraging, particularly for women, because maybe you had a big leg day the day before. And so you have a little bit of inflammation, a little bit of water retention, a little bit of, uh, maybe you ate a meal that was higher in fiber and it's holding a little water. Maybe you just had a higher carbohydrate meal and the glycogen's holding a little water in the muscle. Those are all things that could affect uh, women in the menstrual period that could affect weight from day to day. Um, but if you hang in there, the research also shows that if you hang in there, even when you have a plateau, be patient, be persistent, um, eliminate the potential uh, errors uh, by counting calories accurately and uh, making sure your step count is, is sustained, uh, you'll find that the weight loss will begin again. And at some point, you may reach a plateau simply because you've lost enough weight such that your metabolism has slowed a little bit. And that's expected. That's normal. You're not going to burn as many calories, you know, when you're 150 pounds as you did when you were 200 pounds. Uh, that's, that's a, you're expected to have a reduction in your total daily metabolic rate, in which case you might have to reduce uh, some more calories in order to continue to, to pursue your goals. So the main um, like rocks people should focus on from a nutrition standpoint um and what we're talking about is protein fiber foods that are highly satiable um you know sleep's obviously not a food thing but food but sleep impacts satiety and hunger and stuff like that um focusing on whole foods drinking enough water and then also finding the the flavor of caloric restriction that works best for the individual and then from a weightlifting and exercise perspective, it's resistance training anywhere between two to five, six times a week or whatever is most maintainable for the individual and making sure you're training, training hard enough that you are training to, to near failure and producing um, and, uh, and really like working your muscles to near fatigue. And then also getting in daily steps, like the steps should be an everyday thing, right? Oh, absolutely. 10 minute walks. A hundred percent. And so let's just say now that for the sake of argument that this person is now progressing, they're losing weight, they're dropping body fat. And now they're at a place where they're like, ah, I feel great. I'm doing well. Um, I'm, I'm following Stan's advice. I've gotten to where I want to be. Now I want to maintain this. Now I want to focus more on overall wellness and longevity and maintaining what I have. What are some of the shifts that have to happen? Um, from a, again, like a long-term point of view for the same person to be able to maintain what they've worked so hard to achieve? Yeah. Well, the nice thing is, is if you retain as much lean body mass as possible while dieting, uh, you'll be able to add back in calories. You'll have less of a decline in your total metabolic rate. And you get to put back in the three to 500 calories that you had taken out in order to lose weight. So you, that's a, a nice place uh, to get to. And then you get to eat a little more food. Uh, and so that makes the diet a little more sustainable. But in terms of long-term health, uh, you know, sleep's going to be the, the, the major one. That's the biggest priority. It's the, the foundation upon which everything else sits. And so if you've gotten good sleep habits, uh, quantity and quality, uh, for those people with apnea, getting a CPAP, uh, being careful about interruptions during the night, you know, cool room, quiet room, dark room, make sure that there aren't pets or kids disturbing your sleep in the middle of the night. So sleep's the big one. Uh, the next is going to be increasing your cardiovascular fitness and your strength. Those are two very big predictors of uh, not just lifespan, but health span, a more important, I think, metric that people should be paying attention to. Um the cardiovascular fitness 
could be achieved simply from, uh, you know, just increasing your pace, getting your heart rate up a little bit uh, and consistently doing that on a daily basis. Uh, and then incorporating some hip training would be nice twice a week. Get on one of those uh, assault bikes and, and just go all out for 15 seconds and do about, you know, a few rounds of those. That would give you uh, a really good cardiovascular stimulus. And then just continue to get stronger. It's a really important component long term is that your your strength is a good predictor of uh, of your health span. They use proxy measurements like grip strength, et cetera. But it, it, all it is is to measure uh, really the the accumulation of hard work that you've put in, uh, either whether it's resistance training or cardio. And it's important to recognize that the vast majority of your benefits, uh, your health and life extension benefits are realized from going from zero to, you know, something sufficient rather than uh, thinking that you have to become a Olympic athlete or something to have, uh, you know, those benefits actually, as you get, as your cardiovascular fitness improves, you get less and less, it becomes what we call, uh, uh, asymptotic, right? The, the slope, uh, your, your return on investment, uh, is not as significant. And so I don't encourage people to, to do any more than, than what they're inclined to be able to sustain over the long term. Uh, because that, that could be kind of discouraging. Like we talked about, you start a program you can't adhere to and next thing you know, you just abandon the whole thing and feel like you're a failure. I'd rather have something that's, that's part of a lifestyle that you enjoy doing that you could do consistently. And if you accumulate enough, uh, cardiovascular work and, and, uh, and strength training, you'll have a uh, much less likelihood of suffering from any of the, uh, the chronic illnesses that we seem to be experiencing because we're 70% overweight and obese and, um, uh, sedentary. So would you say the number one thing that people can do if they're trying to increase their health span or trying to live longer is to, to get to a healthy body weight, right? And have more muscle. A hundred percent. Yeah. And I said this on a podcast, a little clip was posted on the internet that went viral and people just lost their shit. I said, even the McDonald's diet, uh, 95% of health benefits are realized simply from weight loss itself. Uh, and this is borne out in the literature as well, in the, the research, irrespective of diet, even what would might be considered an unhealthy diet, a high saturated, a keto diet, high saturated fat, low in fiber. Uh, and you can do a keto diet with low saturated fat and some fiber. I'm just saying that most people don't, uh, it has been shown to improve all the biomarkers with just the weight loss itself. And that means a decrease in blood pressure, a decrease in blood sugars, a decrease in lipids, uh, LDL. Um, all of those things are realized simply from weight loss itself, irrespective of diet. Now, I would never recommend a McDonald's diet. I would suggest that people would eat more whole food and less ultra processed food because that's hard to adhere to. Uh, and you'd want more fiber and you'd want, you know, just healthier foods in general. Uh, but you hit the nail right on the head. Uh, maintaining a healthy BMI is, uh, is probably one of the biggest things that you can do for your, uh, because fat is inflammatory. We used to think it was a dormant in the body. And uh, now we find out it has its own, uh, endocrine, 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 endocrine whatever the word is, uh, it's an endocrine organ <laughs> and it releases hormones and it increases inflammation. Uh, so, uh, and you also have to differentiate between the type of fat, uh, women can store more fat subcutaneously in the hips and butt and have less uh, of a compromise on their general health. Whereas men tend to store fat viscerally around the organs. They get fat in their liver and fat in their pancreas. Um, and those things have a much greater uh, detrimental effect on their long-term health than the fat that's stored subcutaneously. So there is, there can be a difference there as well. Yeah, because I think sometimes when people are trying to like get healthier or improve their overall quality of life or reduce, you know, increase longevity and all these things, the first thing they go to is the quality of food, right? They're like, all right, I'm going to eat more vegetables. I'm going to eat more fiber. I'm going to eat, you know, less fatty meat. I'm going to eat more protein, all these things. But if that person is severely overweight or, or obese, the number one thing 
that that person can do for their health is to just reduce the amount of calories they're eating from whatever food they're currently they're currently eating, right? You're absolutely right. And that hurts people's feelings somehow that, that you can lose weight on a shitty diet and be healthier. Uh, some people were like, oh, but McDonald's and cancer. I'm like, well, we know that weight loss is the number one driver of reduction of cancer risk. Uh, so, I mean, you're right. I, I don't suggest that that's a, a long-term plan, but uh, in the immediate sense, uh, that a calorie reduction and weight loss is going to yield the, the greatest uh, uh, acute health benefits. What, we're what we've been talking about throughout the conversation, I think often gets a bad rap in that these quick, quick fixes, jumpstart diets, jumpstart weight loss, you know, fitness transformation programs, they get a bad rap. And I think in a way, obviously, rightfully so, because I think people don't understand that there has to be a maintenance plan after these jumpstarts, and you have to be able to maintain it long term. And that's effective. What I will say is I think there's been a lot of people who have transformed their health for the long run because of the results they saw from a jumpstart program or setting a a goal that challenged them and pushed them. And because they did that, they were able to now have all of these amazing health benefits. Do you think that people, you know, you, you mentioned that people shouldn't necessarily train like an Olympic athlete. And I, I agree with you, but do you think that people should always be focused on something, focused on some sort of fitness goal to be able to maintain their overall, their overall health? Yeah, that's an important thing to talk about what motivates the individual. We talked about dietary adherence based on the program that was the, the least restrictive to you. We talked about creating habits uh, for things like 10 minute walks and et cetera. Uh, goals help. I mean, these, uh, uh, you're right, there is a carrot out there. If you, if you know you have to be on stage at a bikini show in, in four months, you're probably going to work harder. Uh, or if you have a good coach or a good training partner or a spouse that's participating in the program with you, you know, sometimes it can take a village to, you know, to, to get through one of these programs uh, and just surround yourself with people who have similar goals, that kind of thing. So all of those are great motivational tools and people are all motivated differently. Some people are, uh, you know, motivated to prove other people wrong or and some people are motivated to, uh, you know, to uh, just try and, and and just for themselves to achieve a certain goal. It, it really depends. You got to kind of find out what their psychology is and then see if you can guide them, if you're a coach, if you can guide them uh, utilizing the best methods for them. Do you think the progressive overload can be a, just a good long-term goal where people just know that they just follow the, the workout program that they've either had designed for them or that they're following or that they, they've come up with and that the goal is just to get stronger and to, you know, do the assault bike in a faster time and to be able to walk, you know, more steps within the 10 minutes or, or whatever. Like, do you think that's a, a good enough thing that would get most people by? Absolutely. I love strength. Um, I think I saw on a podcast one time and I should try and find out who the guy's name is, but he said, if you go to the gym and you work out hard for an hour and you come home and look in the mirror, you'll see nothing. Uh, and you go to the gym tomorrow and you work out hard for an hour and you come home, you'll see nothing. <laughs> and, and that's true. It takes some time for you to be able to see the results. And that can be discouraging for people. I think that was my podcast. I think that was, Fra that was, that was Frank Carrillo, the well, actor. That was a fantastic piece. I, and, and I think a clip of it was got, went viral. And he's absolutely right. And, and he was kind of talking about the need to create long-term habits. But uh, I use strength. Uh, specifically as a hook. And even when I'm bringing in, you know, upper middle-aged uh, women who haven't trained much before, I'll put them on a trap bar deadlift with a pretty light weight so they can easily handle it. It doesn't take a lot of instruction. Uh, and I just tell them to pick it up and put it down. And then when they come into the next workout three days later or the next week, I'll put five more pounds on it and they'll pick it up and put it down and they'll be extremely happy about the progress. They got stronger and it's measurable. And then they get invested in the next five pounds and the next five pounds. And it's a hook. Now you and I both know being in the industry that uh, the initial gain in strength is what we call neural adaptation. Uh, you just get better at the movement your nervous system learns to recruit and contract the muscles in a coordinated fashion. And, uh, a lot of those initial 
quote unquote strength gains is just practice. Uh, but they're dramatic and they're immediate uh, and they're, they work very well to motivate clients. And so uh, a good friend of mine is, uh, owns Beat Training out of uh, Cincinnati, and he's trained thousands and thousands of people over the last 25 years. He was a uh, NFL S&C coach uh, who started his own facilities, and he does private training. Uh, and they'll train 200 people a day. I mean, they, they, they'll, in groups, him and, him and seven of his trainers, uh, well, I think nine trainers in two facilities will train 200 people a day pretty consistently. And what's really interesting about his gym, you go to most powerlifting gyms and there's a board on the wall and it has the name of the person who has the highest lift, squat, bench, deadlift and total, right? On his board, it's every single client. And it's a whole, it's a lot of different movements. It's a five rep max. It's a trap bar deadlift. It's a, a dumbbell bench press. It, there's like 20 exercises and every single client and he puts their PRs on the board. And then when they come in to train, he's like, pick an exercise, pick a PR, let's beat it. And that's how he trains his clients. And so they have, uh, they're kind of invested in the process. And he breaks them up into, say, men and women and age groups so they can see how they compare to other people in the gym on those lifts. And it becomes very motivating for them. So that's what the hook that we use. That's why we love strength. And I, I know that CrossFit gets a bad rap. And I, it was funny. I was, I was interviewing. You know who Marcus Philly is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I was, I was speaking with him yesterday. And we were talking about CrossFit. And we were just getting into the weeds about it and you know some of the pluses and then some of the things that maybe um, – could be potential negatives with it, but I think that one of the positive things that can be that can also be a negative is that you get these people in the gym, they're pushing themselves right to get better at a certain workout or a certain movement or whatever. The downside, I think, is the programming, and that you get somebody who's newly trained or somebody who just frankly shouldn't be doing some of that stuff. It's just not effective for what they want, and they end up getting hurt or um, just overdoing it and. Um, just seeing some sort of negative side effects from it. Yeah, you know, fortunately in weightlifting, we see about, I think the number is around three or four injuries per thousand hours of participation. Uh, fortunately, it's very low. It's right down there with swimming. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's certainly a lot less than kids playing on the jungle gym. Uh, but it's a very low injury potential. But you're right. There are opportunities for people to do things without proper supervision or instruction. Uh, we see that in all sports, CrossFit, et cetera. Those have a higher injury rate than weightlifting. Interestingly enough, 65% of injuries in the gym are people dropping weights on themselves, not lifting. <laughs> so, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually, I, I run a kid's power hour every Sunday. Uh, at my gym here in town at Sin City Iron in Las Vegas. And I, I take little kids, some of them six, seven years old, uh, my own kids, nine and 11. And uh, we run them through a squat bench and deadlift. And then we take them through an assortment of different things like box jumping and uh, med ball throws and uh, sled pushes and uh, chin ups. Um, and one of the things we teach them, obviously, is, you know, proper form. Uh, but we, we want them to have fun. That's the most important thing is that we we set everything up so that they can enjoy it. And we do try and measure things and say, hey, last time you got three, let's, let's see if you can get four. Let's add five pounds. And that's the way that the kids can get invested in their progress. For you personally, like what have you found that has kept you going at this for so long? I mean, because you are so consistent, you're so knowledgeable, you, have, you know all the research, but your journey with all of this has, has evolved over the years as far as like what you've you know, been into what you haven't been into, but the main thing is you've been just consistent and kept showing up. Like, what have you, what do you think are like the main, if you had to look back and say like, these are the main reasons why I'm still where I, where I'm at now, I'm not, you know, you're not like hurt, you know, you're still able to get after it regularly. Like why, why have you been able to do that? Yeah. Well, I think first and foremost, I really enjoyed weightlifting. That's again, I recognize that not everybody does. So I'd be cautious about my prescription for them. I just loved it. I love the feeling of it. Like Arnold said, I go to the gym, I come in the morning, I come at night, the pump, the pump, you know, he, that for me, I've just loved the process of weightlifting and it, there's so many variables. I mean, you've got all the different body parts to train. You've got different, uh, 
uh, loads, you've got different, you know, rep ranges, uh, you know, and I started competing. And so I had, like you said, I had the carrot. I wanted to be a, a great power lifter. I wanted to be a great bodybuilder. And so, I mean, for many, many, many years, that, that was my driving force uh, all the way up and through until my mid forties. Uh, and then after I retired from competing, I, I did, I did accumulate a significant number of injuries, which anybody would do in, in a competitive environment, uh, you know, fitness, uh, the fitness level required to be a, a world's strongest man or a, a power lifter or anything is going to, is going to wear heavy on the body. So I had accumulated some, some tendonitis and some, just some general aches and pains that torn a few muscles over the years and, um, my knees were sore. So that became my new journey when I was about 45, 46 years old. I was like, I want to resolve this pain. Uh, and I started training with the intent of, of improving my general health and, and, uh, and my pain and eliminating my pain. And I was able to fully recover. And now a lot of people see me at, you know, almost 56 years old, I can still walk out a 600 pound squat with no knee wraps and no knee sleeves and bury it, um, with no pain. And that, you know, that's important to me. I, I don't try and do the things I was able to do at my peak when I was a younger man. Um, but I try and do things without pain because then it's enjoyable to me. Uh, I train with a little less fatigue now. I try not to do movements that, that uh, create a ton of doms and give me brain fog for two days. Uh, I, I deadlift heavy much less frequently than I used to. Um, uh, those kinds of things. But I just love it. And I, I got to be honest with you. I remember I was in a seminar once with Hofthor Bjornsson and I, and somebody asked, you know, how do you stay motivated? And Hofthor begrudgingly answered, you know, nicely. And we got in the car to drive away. He goes, I hate when people ask me that question. How can you not stay motivated? You know, that that's, that's a Vikings mindset, you know, that's a, and, and so it's hard for me to answer that question. Either you, you like it or you don't, either you're motivated or you're not. And, you know, searching around for something or someone to motivate you, maybe you're not doing the thing that you uh, should or, or want to do. Uh, find that, uh, chase that. Mark Bell doesn't compete anymore. He likes to run now. Uh, you know, uh, his, uh, his buddy up there in SEMA, uh, prioritizes jujitsu and trains to optimize that. Uh, so I just, I, and I see a lot of power lifters finding other sports, uh, that are still active. Jujitsu seems to be real popular. Uh, but I just find the thing that you love to do, and then you can use the weight training to make you better at that because, you know, strength improves just about all sports. You just shared a lot of what's kept you going on your fitness journey. Imagine you're you're having a conversation. Imagine you you run into this person at a a local restaurant, grocery store, at your gym, and they're beginning this journey of wanting to drop the body fat, the 15 to 20 pounds, as effectively and as quickly as possible. If you had a few minutes with them to share some words of encouragement before they got started, what would you say to them? Yeah, I would say that it's a marathon, not a sprint, and there is no finish line. You use the perfect word. It's a journey. And I would want them to create a program that not to set themselves up for failure, create a program that fits your current lifestyle, fits your schedule. Uh, just be consistent. Find things you enjoy. That includes both the diet. I've always said the best diet is the one you'll follow and the training. The best, uh, the best exercise is the one you'll do. Not everybody likes to lift weights. We'll find some way to incorporate strength training into any uh, enjoyable fitness pursuit and, and get them to set up a schedule that they can consistently adhere to and take these small steps and understand that, that this, again, is not something, it's not a means to an end. If they start exercising, they're going to have to exercise for the rest of their life. Because once you stop, <laughs> then, you know, the weight comes back on and the health deteriorates. That's the thing about cardio and weight training is, is uh, Joe Rogan referred to it as building a sandcastle, bodybuilding in particular. But it's true of anything. Same with your cardiovascular health. When you stop doing it, then you have a decline in performance. It, it dissipates over time. Whether it's cardio, whether it's bodybuilding, whether it's lifting weights, strength, muscle, mass, they all, without a sufficient consistent stimulus, will start to decline over time. And so you, you, you better find something that you enjoy, that you'll do consistently. The journey matters more than the destination.
Stan, thank you so much for coming on. If people want to connect with you, if they want to learn more about what you're doing, if they want to learn more about the vertical diet, where do they do that? StanEfforting.com. I compiled everything into a 225-page ebook that's co-authored by Dr. Damon McCune, who's a PhD RDN, Director of Dietetics at UNLV. It's very well supported with over 200 scientific references to peer-reviewed published literature. Um, I have a link there for my meal prep company. I ship meals nationwide in the USA and make your food and send it to your door. Uh, Instagram is at Stan Efforting. YouTube, I have a lot of rants on there that uh, are fun to, to listen to. That's also Stan Efforting. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure to include the links to that stuff in the show notes. And thank you so much for coming back on the show. Thank you, brother. Great talking to you.